Uh, very pleased to have on the line with us Katrina Vanden Heuvel, the publisher and editor of The Nation magazine, the website thenation.com. Her most recent piece is titled Time to End the Bloody Ukraine Conflict. Katrina, welcome back to the program. Thank you, Tom. It's always nice having you uh, having you with us. I have a um, just as a as a starting point into this topic. I have in my hands a, a an article by Roman Olya Olya I can't pronounce it in Kiev and Jivan oh. Vazgar in Berlin yes. from the Financial Times. The headline is Germany urges Ukraine to accept federal solution with separatists. Can you explain uh, to our to our listeners and viewers? what a federal solution is, why Germany is promoting this, and and what this has to do with what's going on right now in Ukraine. Let me just, if I could, step back, Tom, sure. because this weekend has been an interesting one in terms of the possibilities of a ceasefire holding, a ceasefire that was uh, put in place September 5th, negotiated by envoys from Ukraine, Russia, the rebels, and the Organization for Security and Co- Cooperation in Europe. And that has as its basis uh, one of the points is this idea raised by the authors, one in Berlin, about autonomy or federalization. You know, there are other parts of this world where there are countries which have federalist, uh, more autonomy. There's been a misconception in this country uh, that Russia wants Ukraine to be divided. Uh, All along, the Russian position has been uh, and the position of those in the southeastern part of Ukraine is not independence. It is uh, autonomy. It is federalism. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't know if people remember, but the rebel leaders in Donbass uh, in uh, June, I believe, were seeking greater local autonomy within Ukraine through a referendum on federalism. Right. So I, th- I think that's important. I also think it's important that you're here in Germany speak out that way, because what we saw this weekend, Tom, were war parties on both sides, but the Ukrainian side is deeply divided with the president, Poroshenko, continuing to insist that there is only a military, I'm sorry, a political solution to the crisis. Prime Minister Yatsenyuk, on the other hand, announced at a conference held in Kiev a few days ago that only NATO Only Ukraine and NATO would be a possible resolution of the conflict. And meanwhile, what we're witnessing in the uh, particular part of Ukraine called Mariupol is you're witnessing the possibility of counterinsurgency guerrilla warfare emerging from paramilitaries discontent, in fact, disgusted with the official Kiev Ukrainian army. And it's unclear who's in control. I mean, you Mm. have a president saying we need a political solution. You have a prime minister saying the only way forward is Ukraine and NATO, which all sides to the ceasefire a few days ago acknowledged was a red line. And then you have the beginning of these paramilitary forces, paramilitary units fighting the rebels in the southeast of Ukraine, and the Kiev army losing control. So it's a very dangerous uh, situation, as anyone you know, just listening to the basic outline of this might know, because... You know, the the elements of the Kiev elite, who Yatsenyuk, the prime minister, represents, are basically saying, we are ready for a war between NATO slash the U.S. and Russia. This is actual, not Cold War. And by the way, this is something Stephen Cohen, who has written for the nation since the crisis began, who's written for many years, full disclosure, my husband, has been warning about and warning against since... uh, February, March of this year, the real danger that the new Cold War line is not down the middle of Berlin, but is now close on the borders of Russia, possibly into Ukraine. Right. So, and just just for for definitions, um, a lot of people may not know what you mean when you say federalism. Can you define that term? You know, uh, protection for local election of mayors, for example. Mm -hmm. Uh, More autonomy in local elections. Respect for language. This has been a big problem When the Maidan protests erupted, one of the first acts of the new Rada or parliament was to uh, prohibit the use of Russian language in parts of Ukraine. That was quickly overturned, but it aroused so much resentment, so many grievances, 
that that too, in a deeply divided, historically divided, dramatically divided Ukraine, has to be part of any kind of uh, greater local autonomy, uh, federalist structure. Um, So I think, again, but Tom, some of this, as you well know, because you've studied, I think, federalism in different countries over time, in different historical contexts, the issue of autonomy and what that autonomy or federalism will look like is going to be part of any negotiation. And the deeper we get into the splintering, the factionalization, the more difficult that kind of possibility is to arrive at. I would say we're seeing another division. You mentioned, very interesting, the role Germany, Angela Merkel of Germany has played. But NATO itself is divided in terms of uh, approach to Ukraine. There is a story out this past weekend. Again, this is basically sourced to the Prime Minister Yatsenuk that five NATO countries have promised to provide weapons to Ukraine. There are denials, and certainly Slovakia, the Czech Republic, and Hungary have split with Poland in terms of a more robust, muscular, aggressive approach to uh, support of Ukraine. And as you can hear in that story you began with, Germany all along has tried to find a political resolution and has at times, I think, divided off from the United States, where I think the neocons have basically been given control of the Ukraine policy. Yeah. So, you know, the the narrative that we hear in the United States is that this is all, uh, you know, crazy Vladimir Putin doing a land grab and trying to reconstruct the Soviet empire, et cetera, et cetera. Um, Is there any truth to that? There is. uh, Let's begin with the dominant narrative. Um, And it's very important to do so, Tom, because media coverage, you know this well, media can often define the reality in which we operate because media privileges certain viewpoints. Uh, Media defines reality for, uh, you know, for for people. Often it makes people spectators, not not citizens. But Mm -hmm. um, there would have been no civil war in this historically deeply divided country, if the European Union had not insisted, and this was last November, on an exclusive economic association agreement that deeply prejudiced Ukrainian industry in the East and trade with Russia, or if the United States and European nations had used their influence with the demonstrators to abide by a February 21st agreement that President Viktor Yanukovych, deeply corrupt, unliked, but he signed, it would have handed more power to Parliament and called for elections in in December. This was an agreement that was tossed away because of the protests in the street, but it was an agreement that would have calmed worries in Crimea and the East about the rights, as I said earlier, of Russian-speaking Ukrainians. Instead, and here is where the narrative has never really, you don't hear this, the U.S. and the EU have encouraged the most radical elements in the Kiev government, which is what we're witnessing today. It is interesting that Poroshenko is emerging more though he presided, and again, some think that he wasn't his own man, over this intense military campaign, this, quote, anti-terrorist operation. But there are many who think that the more these paramilitary forces, the more far-right ultranationalist forces, have really pushed him into this. But now we're seeing the most radical elements in the Kiev government saying, we don't want a, mili- uh, a political solution. Hmm. And so the, 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 our responsibility uh, goes you know, beyond the immediate crisis Tom, as well. I mean, we spoke last week. There wouldn't have been such a kind of concerted Russian nationalist response, and there has been. And there's no question that Russia has contributed to tensions in the region. But uh, if we hadn't been part of the expansion of NATO into Eastern Europe and now into the borders of Russia, a move that George Kennan, father of containment, eminent diplomat, thought was the most favorable era of the Cold War period, if we had not pushed that as hard, we would be in a different place. Because NATO essentially is at the heart. Of Katrina, the- can you stick around? Absolutely. Okay, hang on. Thank this you. is the Tom Hartman program. We're talking with Katrina Vandenhuvel, the uh, the editor and publisher of the Nation, thenation.com. Her most recent piece, "Time to End the Bloody Ukraine Conflict." Check it out. We'll be right back with more. Katrina. Welcome back. Katrina, are you still here with us? I am. I just wanted, if I could, Tom, you mentioned, you know, I think what, one of the key points, pillars of the narrative is also that Russia's annexation of Crimea 
mm-hmm. which was a violation of the international order. Uh, and is you know we we've seen other countries, including our own beloved country, violate international law, international order. But that was interpreted as a possible prelude to further territorial expansion. And I think that is where the narrative breaks down in fundamental ways. You, Crimea, as many of your listeners may know, was an exceptional circumstance. Uh, it was, first of all, part of Russia. F- former Soviet leader Nikita Khrushchev gave it as a birthday gift in 1954. It had Soviet military, Russian military bases. And there was a unique combination of this o- overwhelming desire of the local population to secede from Ukraine, the need to prevent military clashes on the peninsula, and Russian troops already stationed there. But since then, I think as a part of the breakdown of the narrative, the developments in southeastern Ukraine have been interpreted through the prism of Crimea when, in fact, there is great local support for uh, the, the rebels and a deep distrust of what has happened in Kiev in these last months on the part of the ethnic Russian population of southeastern Ukraine. Now, this is not to say that the military conflicts we've seen, uh, rebels or the Ukrainian army are to be countenanced or to be condoned, because what's happened, Tom, as you you know, and only recently, by the way, in the last six weeks, two months, have we seen the humanitarian catastrophe unfolding in southeastern Ukraine. But ordinary people are being caught up in this crisis, and we've witnessed a million Ukrainians displaced and close to 3,000 uh, killed in the conflict. So it's just, there is a narrative that needs to be told and that gets lost, and uh, I think the elites and the basic media coverage has gotten caught up in trying to equate what happened in Crimea with what is unfolding in southeastern Ukraine. Yeah, I, th- I think that that's a that's an excellent point. And and um, in about a minute and a half, right now we're we're talking to about half our audience, our our Pacific audience and our Free Speech TV audience. Our commercial stations will rejoin us in about a minute and a half. And I want to just restate that very quickly when that happens. But also there is this. Uh, there has been discussion in the in the press about Russia is trying to come up with a contiguous, basically land bridge across southeastern Ukraine to Crimea. Crimea. What do you think of that? You know, I think that will provoke further tensions. I think uh, that is going to be part of any negotiation that one hopes will unfold, because the bottom line is that it's time to end the blood and the. Uh, horrors of this Ukraine conflict, but I, I think that is very tricky, but as I said, must be part of any political negotiation that um, is key. I, you know, one thing I wanted to say is that gets lost as well is one of the precipitating factors for the protests in uh, November and February. First of all, the EU association agreement, what's often forgotten, is that there were clauses in it that had military components. It, for some who studied it carefully, it looked like a Trojan horse to get Ukraine into NATO. But those protests by Maidan and Maidan, the protesters, and all power to them, and I'll I'll come back to it, Tom, if I might, had to do with something you and I care deeply about, which is corruption. Sure. Okay. We'll we'll continue this conversation in about 15 seconds. Katrina Vandenhovel is with us with the editor and publisher of The Nation magazine, thenation.com. We'll be right back. Welcome back. Tom Harvin here with you. And Katrina Vandenhovel on the line with us, the editor and publisher of The Nation magazine. TheNation.com is the website. Katrina, just just to, to recap, uh, you know, resummarize the current situation in Ukraine. Well, we're, uh, a ceasefire was uh, put in place September 5th, negotiated by envoys from Ukraine, Russia, the rebels, the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe. And it's broadly holding... Uh, despite regular and but sporadic violations, especially in key flashpoints such, such as Donetsk. However, inside Ukraine, putting aside Russia and the focus, obviously, in the narrative in this country on Russia, but you're seeing real divisions emerge between a president, Poroshenko, who says the only resolution of this conflict is a political one, the prime minister, Yatsenyuk, who this past 
weekend spoke to a conference in Kiev and said the only resolution is if Ukraine is in NATO, and NATO comes to its defense. And then in the southeast, you have the possibility of, because the Ukrainian army is collapsing, the emergence of paramilitaries, which have become something of a wild card in this conflict. Many of them include activists, blue-collar workers, professionals. But some of these union, units, like the Azov Battalion, have become a haven for far-right thought. And like the Russian rebels, the, the rebels themselves have been charged by Amnesty International with committing extortion, abuses, kidnapping. So you're seeing a fracturing that needs to be woven back together if there is going to be some possibility of what needs to happen, which is a ceasefire to end the bloody Ukraine conflict. What should the United States be doing? The United States, we spoke earlier about Germany, and Germany, uh, Angela Merkel, has played a constructive role for m most of these weeks in being an a interlocutor with Putin, but also Germany seeking a political resolution. I th the, what needs to happen if is Ukraine is going to emerge as an economically viable country with the possibility of a democratic future, it needs to be a bridge between Russia and the West instead of a pawn. The IMF is already warning that the country's in uh, free fall uh, in terms of GDP. 27%, I think, of the industrial production of the country is in Southeast. Uh, the corruption is mounting, according to uh, uh, observers. So I think you need to strike, you, you need to drive as hard as you can toward a political resolution in which, as we've talked about, Tom, key issues such as the level of autonomy or what kind of federalism can be worked out, respect for the Russian language, local elections, uh, respect and a stability. And of course, the key thing, and this is where the prime minister is so incendiary, that Ukraine be a, a, a non-aligned, non-aligned mm -hmm. like Finland or even Austria, and that it not be part of NATO, but that it have the possibility of working with both uh, Russia and the West to, to develop a stable country. The narrative in this country, the media, Tom, needs to shift, but that's going to, you know, I, I will say one thing. I, I, I find that the, the generation of political and public discourse about Ukraine, about the conflict, um, harkens back to other bad eras in our time. There needs to be a marketplace of ideas, a range of views, but the lockdown in terms of a discussion of Ukraine in which you're accused of being pro-Russian, if you raise key questions about the narrative that so drives policy and debate in this country, is truly dispiriting. Even John Mearsheimer, major figure at the University of Chicago, major theorist of international relations, who wrote a very good piece I write about in my column for Foreign Affairs, which is the you know, esteemed establishment publication, is, you know, is under fire from some in the field, including the former Ambassador to Russia, U.S. Ambassador Michael McFaul. I mean, there should be a debate. There should be a debate. And we see that to a certain extent in places like Germany, which uh, shows why there is a different kind of approach. Yeah. Yeah, Germany's having a fairly active debate about this. Uh, I, I told Steve about this. I, I was in, in Germany a few months ago, and they, in their, the newspapers were all about how many former prime ministers of Germany were saying, no, you know, NATO should not be going into Ukraine. This is crazy. Well, we got, you know, we talked about one thing that often gets lost in all of this as well, Tom, which you bring back into the picture is history. Yeah. You know, in 2004, NATO admitted seven new members, including the Baltic states along the Russian border. And four years later, the George W. Bush administration failed to win acceptance. There was a fight. They wanted to win acceptance for Georgia and Ukraine, but that bid faced significant opposition from Germany and France. Right. So we've seen the understanding on the part of Germany um, about the danger of NATO expansion and how it has aroused the resentment, the grievances in in Russia. And I think, um, you know, it's, it's very important that we hear those voices um, as well. And by the way, often it's said that, oh, Germany, they're doing it because they need the oil and gas. They've been bought. Mm -hmm. I don't think, I mean, that there, is, there are certainly trade ties, important trade ties, but there's also a history and a memory in Germany, it seems to me, of the danger of baiting a Russia. Why not have a relationship with Russia that permits for uh, a Europe that is independent but is not at war with uh, 
you know, and I'm talking Cold War with Russia. Right. That was, in fact, an important idea that former Soviet leader Mikhail Gorbachev, who really saw a more united Europe, including Russia, had spoken to and hoped for. And the roots of the conflict today, the NATO expansion, really shattered that promise. Yeah, he had a deal with George Herbert Walker Bush that uh, NATO would not, also would not take the Baltic states. I mean, Estonia has a border, a direct border with Russia. Uh, Russia, Latvia, uh, Lithuania. Russia, there's a dispute, Tom, but Russia ostensibly received from the George H.W. Administ- Bush administration, quote, NATO will not expand one inch to the east. Right. Uh, there is a dispute. Nothing was written down. Uh, Gorbachev himself regrets that. Um, he comes under fire in Russia today for having capitulated and not driven a better deal with the United States, with NATO. Mm. Uh, but Russia today, we you know, don't need to tell you, but if you look at what's going on in Ukraine, there's no question that Russia clearly views NATO expansion not only as provocative, but as a betrayal of an agreement. Yeah. Well, just just as, as Jack Kennedy did when, when the Soviets tried to put missiles right. in Cuba. Cuba. Yep. Yeah. Katrina Vanden Heuvel, uh, a brilliant, thoughtful piece, strongly recommend it. TheNation.com, time to end the bloody Ukraine conflict. Thank you, Katrina. Thank you, Tom. Thank you. Great talking with you, as always. You're listening to the Tom Hartman Program. Call 866-987-THOM. And you, as I said, you can find Katrina's article, and it really, really is worth reading, over at TheNation.com. 